so much. Uh, so good morning, everybody. The embarrassing thing is that you probably all do speak English, and I don't speak any of your nine languages or whatever it is you speak here. Um, I, I spoke to somebody yesterday, and, and they said, oh, I, I tried to say it in Dutch, and, it and they asked if I could say it in French. I was like, you're just taking the mic now. Like, you're just, whatever. So um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Um, I, today, I'd like to talk to you about a whole plethora of things, but not least of all, uh, why game-based learning is a game-changer in what is in our education system. People talk about AI as the great game-changer, and it will be, 100%, but, uh, but, it, but games, game-based learning and education has been pushing the fringes of education and really nudging a lot of the theory in, and practice in, in education for some time. Yes, start my timer, by all means, because <laughs> I could talk forever. That's a good thing, right? Okay. Um, and so please feel free to connect with me. That's my, um, uh, my email and Twitter up there. Feel free to tweet uh, while you're, you're uh, listening. Also, uh, what I'd like to do is start, though, I think it's important to say, you know, why I believe I can stand before you and talk to you on this subject is, is because I've done, I want to talk to you a bit about my history, about what brings me here. And the first is that I was a pilot for many years. Um, I actually didn't start in education. I flew planes for a long, long time. And it's a wonderful feeling to be up there um, in the sky. This is a picture taken of me in one of my planes. This is another one. I flew over New York once, and uh, a friend of mine who was in another plane took a picture of me. But I kind of got bored of that, and I thought, you know what? I, I actually want to see more of the world from the ground. And so I went into trucking, and I actually got involved in a lot of tr I kind of I big Euro trucks. And I loved it, and I spent many, many years just driving around Europe. This is one of my... Uh, this is one of my trucks here. And I'm a big machine guy, so eventually I got bored of driving around Europe and I thought, I want to buy some land. And so I did, and I became a farmer. This is a picture of me in my combine harvester, and I spent many, many years farming and all sorts of, all manner of crops. And then I thought, you know what? The farmhouse was a mess, and so I flipped it. I kind of did my farmhouse up and turned it into this beautiful property that I could sell, and I thought I could do that for other people. So I went into house flipping. And I was able to take rooms that looked like this and turn them into rooms that looked like that. It was such a beautiful thing to be able to do. And, uh, and, and then I thought, you know what? I'm not active enough. Like, really, I don't have an active lifestyle. Even that was quite sedentary, um, really. And so I got into sport. That's me on the left. And I, uh, and I, and I thought, I'll become, and I, of all the sports, I thought, why not? American football. So I got involved in that. And I did a bit of American football. And then I, got, I thought, you know what? I'll go back to the farming thing was a big thing for me. But I thought, I'm going to buy a zoo. So a few years ago, I bought a zoo in America, and I turned it into a multi-million dollar successful business. And I mean, the money is, is neither here nor there, because what was important was that every one of those species, it has been saved because of me. Like, I saved the puff adder from extinction, personally, um, and all the, the red panda, me, it's just amazing. Um, and I learned so much about those species while I was there, and I loved them. But it was a difficult thing because actually anim animals are, we, we see them, you can see them in zoos. I wanted real animals. So I found myself a flux capacitor. I made a time machine, and I went back in time, and I thought we we're just going to catch ourselves a dinosaur, and I did. This is me and my mates trying to catch a T-Rex. Didn't end well for me, mate Dave. Uh, God rest his soul. Um, but uh, we, we finally caught one, and I spent many, many years there. But then I thought, if I could do that, if I can go back to dinosaur times, which my history friends all laugh at, they're like, there weren't dinosaur times. I was like, there was, I was there. Um, but I, so then I thought, well, why not just go to ancient Egypt? And so I just rigged up the time machine. I went to ancient Egypt. I spent a lot of time wandering around, learning about the clothing, culture, currency, language, food, religion. Uh, learned to read and write hieroglyph. Uh, it was a pretty fascinating time. And then I thought I'll do the same in ancient Greece. So I went to ancient Greece and I spent some time there. Um, and uh, and that, again, wonderful adventure. Started a war with the Persians. My bad. Um, and then I thought, well, do it. actually, the war meant I had to get out. So I reset the time machine. And this time I went to the Viking times and I became a Viking in uh, Scandinavia. And it wasn't all playing dice games, you know. It actually got a bit violent. This is, that's me on the left. Um, and we went to war and we went right on raids. And it was just such an amazing time. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to skip forward a few years and I'm going to see the expansion of... Uh, of, of, of the discovery of America. I'm going to walk from the east to the west. I'm going to beat, um, uh, I'm going to beat 
Lewis and Clark to it, and I just wandered across America. That's actually the house that I lived in, built it myself, by the way, um, and lived there in Montana for many, many years. And then I, uh, well, the war came, right? And I just, that's me on the right. <laughs> um, get that one right. Um, that's me on the right, and, uh, and I served in World War I, which was horrific, and then I served in World War II because I thought... Might as well skip forward and do my bit there as well. So I served in World War II. And actually, to this day, because I look like it, right, I serve in many, many military operations around the world um, in all sorts of arenas. Um, that's me in the middle. Um, with the, that's me up front. And then I just lost track of reality altogether, and I just became a unicorn, right? <laughs> I just turned entirely into a unicorn, and I spent my time in those old 1980s posters that you used to get with a wolf howling at the moon, and the moon was melting into a waterfall or something, um, and I spent so much time in those posters just collecting teardrops and jumping through uh, railways. And I think it's maybe even just at this slide you've realised that I didn't do any of these things, all right? I don't know what point the penny dropped, but, um, but I didn't do any of these things, except I did, and this is my point today. I did all these things. I had those experiences. I can say I've flown planes. Not for real, for sure. That takes years of your life and dedication and lots of money and a probably some sort of career or at least very heavy hobby commitment. But I did fly planes and it felt real. I immersed myself in that space. I did drive trucks. I did flip houses. I did run a zoo. I did turn it into a $4 million turnover business. I did learn all about the, the rare bonobo uh, monkeys. I did all of those. I was a unicorn, which incidentally is the national animal of Scotland. I'm just putting that out there. It's on our passports. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's how cool we are. Um, and, and, and so I did all of those things. I can say I've done all of those things because it felt real to me. I immersed myself in those spaces. And I think one of the things we're in danger of doing across uh, our education system, the more we push back against games, is that we are denying our students those experiences. We're not allowing our students the space to explore immersive worlds in which they can try and think and learn and be and empathize as other people and other, other things, doing other things. And so I want to put a challenge out to you that says, when was the last time you climbed a tree? Like, really? When was the last time any of you clambered up a tree? And not for any reason, not because you needed to get a cat down or something, right? But because you looked at it and thought, I want to climb that. Because I see trees all over the place and I think, oh, I could get up that. But, but something inside of me tells me that I shouldn't and I don't. Because society all over, certainly Western democratic countries, tells us that that's wrong, right? Adults don't climb trees. Incidentally, this is a tree uh, outside my property in Scotland on a misty morning um, in the highlands of Scotland. And I did climb that tree and I did get in trouble. Because here's the thing. If you go outside right now, somewhere in, in, in Kotrick, and you climbed a tree, someone would phone the police, probably. That's what they did to me. Someone phoned the police. And the police came and said, what are you doing up there? And I said, just climbing the tree. And they said, well, you're going to have to get down. And I said, why? And they said, because you're not supposed to. I said, is there a law against that? Now, I'm not one for winding up the police. I respect them. But I said, is there a law against that? And they said, well, public nuisance. I was like, am I, though? Am I being a public nuisance by sitting in this tree? Squirrels are public nuisance. But, um, but, but human, squirrels aren't, but humans are. But it's more than that. It's not just that humans are public nuisance. Adults are public nuisance. Because a child wouldn't, you wouldn't phone the police on a child. You wouldn't say, oh, there's a kid climbing a tree outside. Come and get them down. And the police would come and say, hey, son, get down off that tree. It wouldn't happen. It's not a conversation that would happen in our society. But it does because we're adults. And so I got a bit obsessed with this, and I thought to myself, I'm going to look this up. So I went on the internet, and I looked up man in tree. That's what I got, because that's how I spend my time in the woods. Um, just <laughs> catalogue photograph, <laughs> probably selling the shirt or something. But that, yeah, so, yeah, so then I thought, well, I wonder if there's any more. And I got this guy, because he's being really serious, right? Because the only reason you really ought to be hanging around trees is if you're doing something scientific, like looking at the produce of the tree. Uh, here's a guy who, uh, he's a mushroom guy. He's a mushroom fanatic. This next one's actually quite fun, but it's also very serious. This guy lives in a tree. 
Now, this is a funny picture taken of him, but he famously went and lived in a tree. Um, and again, there was protests against him. People in the local community called the police. His house was removed twice, and he was like, I just want to live in the tree. Um, and he wasn't allowed. He built a house, and he had water structures and everything. It was pretty fascinating. And then this one, this is the crux of it. This is internet search, man in tree. Literally, man in tree. And you can buy that suit, apparently. And so then I thought, well, woman in tree. Maybe women climb trees, right? Because <laughs> I'm sure that's... Ha with a, the violin, I can't even tell you what that... Because that's how musicians spend their time in the woods. Um, then there's this woman who married one. She famously married a tree and I think recently celebrated her first year anniversary. Um, <laughs> and then the third one is, don't even ask. I have no idea, there's a whole series of these where she looks dead in the tree. And I have no idea why, but that's, that's... But if you look for children in tree, child in tree, boy or girl in tree, and I've only given you four examples, but there are thousands and thousands and th hundreds of thousands of examples of pictures of children playing, swinging, hanging, climbing, jumping out of, because it's okay, right? But it's not for us. They literally phoned the police. And actually, society creates this, it's actually quite damaging, to the point where we actually have signs about it in the UK. I'm sure you do similarly here in Belgium. No ball games. And the, and the ironic thing about those signs is that they're right where you want to play with the ball. There's a big wall you want, uh, that you want to kick the ball against, or there's a big field where you want, to, you want to kick the ball around, and it says no ball games. In fact, I was in Malta last week. I, I didn't get a chance to transfer the photo over, but there's a sign as you walk into this beautiful park with all these winding sort of uh, uh, paths among all these beautiful trees, and it says, the sign is, it, they've gone to great lengths to say no skateboarding, no cycling, no climbing, but, but dogs can... Dogs can be there. Dogs can poop in the, in, the, in the street if they want, but you can't take your skateboard, you can't roll a blade, you can't cycle, uh, and you can't climb. We even go as far as to say, at this one, no ball games, roller boots, skateboards, or cycling. No children playing. Like, who even makes a sign like that? All children's games are strictly forbidden anywhere on this housing complex. Who would want to live there, right? Britain. Brexit. Um... <laughs> I had to say it, I did, I know, madness. So, um, so much so that, um, that Banksy made a sign about it. Like Banksy literally was like, this is ridiculous. And so what are you gonna do? Leave them to play with the signs instead? Now my favorite one is a little church near my home. It's a beautiful little wooden uh, building, early, uh, early 20th century building. And it sits in the middle of a vast lawn on all sides. It's like this huge, 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 huge lawn with a little tiny building in the middle. So much so, and the lawn is always nicely manicured, so much so that on all four sides of the church, the door side plus sides and back, no games on church grounds. God is having none of it, okay? He's not interested in your rollerblading. He's not interested in your... And I've got this theory. What, what do they mean by no games? Because I think one day I'm just going to go and sit on that lawn and play chess and see what they say. Like I imagine a pastor's going to come out and go, can't do that. Like, well, why not? Um, and actually, we go to even greater lengths to do damage to our playfulness, which is really my point. Anybody, any idea what these are? Yeah. They, they, stop, they stop skateboarders from grinding on that thing there. This is a little things that sit in the street, and they stop skateboarders or rollerbladers uh, or BMXers from grinding on those spaces. And you, th you might be sitting thinking, well, too right. But you could sit on it, stand on it, drop your sandwich on it, spill your coffee on it. You can do whatever you want on that as an adult. Quite often in the city, you see that. You see spilled coffee or people have just left their coffee. They got up and walked away and left it. You can litter it, but you can't play on it. Just bonkers. And actually, we go to even greater lengths by designing it. Look what Canada's done. Canada took the time to turn them into maple leaves and stick them on there. Like so much so that we pay taxpayers' money to stop children playing by design. Which is just fascinating. Instead, we send them all to these concrete sections in the middle of a city somewhere outside and we say, go play. Would you want to play there? I mean, if you're a skateboarder, you might. But generally, it's just like, here's this big concrete structure. Go play 
away from the people, away from the shops, away from the houses. Don't make a noise. It's ridiculous. And then we wonder why reports from 2014 right through to COVID suggest that our cities are becoming child-free spaces. Not least of all because people can't afford to live there with families. But even when they can, or even if they visit, the kids aren't allowed to play. There's nothing for them to do. And so our cities across Western Europe and uh, significantly America are becoming child-free spaces. There are no children. Because here's what we want children to do. We want them to play away from the spaces that we own. And then when they do come in, we want them to be good commercial citizens. We want to put everything they do behind a paywall. Skateboarding, we stick it behind a paywall. We brand it. We make clothes and, and, and merchandise out of it. And then we sell it back to them. We do the same with video games. Kids play video games. So what do we do? We make tons of money on that. We stick it behind paywalls and we stick loot boxes in it. And we, and we make them pay money. Actually, we make the... And that's the, the, the strange thing is it's not them that pays the money. It's you. It's the parents that pay the money. So the, the same people that are advocating to stop the play then end up paying for the play that they do do. It's really bizarre. Um, so people then say, yeah, but play's just like a small part of society, right? Like it's, it's, it's not generally something that we should really be focused on as a, as, a, as a significant part of our society. And I say, I don't know actually, because if we look at video games, um, we're not even talking board games, card games, dice games, Dungeons and Dragons, whatever it is you want to play. If we look at any of that uh, stuff that's in a digital space, there are 3.2 billion gamers worldwide. That's almost half the entire population. And by gamers, we mean people that play at least once a week. Um, once a day is actually more like it, which you'll see there um, as we go on. It's the, the industry is worth 197 billion, which is more than television, music, and movies combined. Somebody said to me recently, that can't be true. I said, why? Well, Dr. Dre just sold his entire music collection for 200 million. I was like, 200 million? Is that all? <laughs> like, it's a, that's a drop in the ocean of 197 billion, and, and he's one of the biggest rap artists of all time. We, they don't even touch the surface. The CEO of Netflix was once asked at the height of their success before their sort of general competition, everyone was like, Netflix is kicking butt, said to the CEO, where do you go next? You've already dominated television, where do you go next? And he said, games. And they said, well, you mean like you're going to start making games? Well, incidentally, Netflix have. Um, if you have a Netflix account, you can now get games through your, uh, your, your devices for free. Um, and they've actually got a really, really nice uh, collection. But he didn't mean games. He said, no, I want gaming audiences. He said, I want, we, are, we will not be successful until we start touching the numbers that games get. And we've got more on that um, in a moment, some of the astounding figures that are coming out. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, but it's just kids in the basement, right? It's just kids wearing Star Wars T-shirts, <laughs> Star Wars meme T-shirts in their basement. Not at all. The average gamer is 34 years old. Um, under t there's only 21% of all gamers in the world are even under 20, uh, sorry, are under 18 years old. 21% under 18. And so we, we grossly misunderstand. And I actually think there's no surprise to this. I think when you live in a world where you suppress something, we talk about this quite a lot with alcohol in the UK. If you suppress alcohol, don't be surprised when kids binge drink at 15, 14 and 15 years old because you never talked about it and you made them think it was bad. If you suppress uh, the conversations around sex and growing up around um, uh, healthy sexual relationships, don't be surprised when you have a teenage pregnancy rate that's through the roof. When we suppress these things and we don't talk about them and we don't accept them, we end up with problems in those spaces. Drugs, for example. We do the same with games. So don't be surprised that adults are now throwing themselves into games and virtual reality, yes? Can I ask a question about Star Wars? Does it include also uh, the games you play on your phone and on your iPhone? Yes, so it includes things like Candy Crush Saga. And that's a really good point. Not all games are equal and not all games are the same. And so, for example, and it is true when we talk about male and female, 55% uh, and 45%, it's true that more boys play Call of Duty. Now, we should, we should work to change that. I'm a huge advocate of that. A lot of my work is in gender equality and digital spaces. But it's true. But it's also true that more girls play 
uh, Candy Crush Saga and Gems of War. And so, um, and, and a lot of that's to do with lifestyle and accessibility and, and so on and so on. And um, so they're not all made equal. But, but don't be surprised that our adults are throwing themselves into games and we're spending 197 billion, six billion just on hardware, etc. when we've suppressed the ability for us to climb trees in the first place. We don't let, we weren't, we, I wasn't allowed to skateboard or cycle or, or rollerblade. So I turned to digital instead. So again, the same adults that are going, oh, all my kids do is watch YouTube videos of Minecraft and then and they go and play Minecraft for like five hours a day. And I say to them, are, are you letting them do other things? And they go, well, no, they're not allowed to and they're not allowed and they're not allowed. And I'm like, hmm. So we can't really argue with that, I think. We, we were the same. Um, and then if we talk a bit more about this one on this side, this is just the growth. And these, by the way, are post-pandemic growth um, post uh, uh, with, with the acceptance of a recession, uh, these are accepted figures. So we still know that in Europe, for example, the industry is going to grow by 30% despite a recession in everywhere else. Big tech companies are aware of it. Microsoft is not trying to buy Activision Blizzard for $69 billion for nothing. They know that this is an industry and a space that is going to climb. Um, interestingly, this one here, for a bit of fun, um, Dr. Jane McGonigal, have you read Reality is Broken? I would, if you haven't, read Reality is Broken from 2012. It's a wonderful book that sets a, a, a the president for a lot of the work that, um, that you might want to do in, in considering games and education. And uh, she talks about surgeons. Surgeons, famously, um, a study in 2004, uh, 2011, 2014, and another one in 2019, looked at um, acute surgery practitioners, uh, heart, surgery, gut surgery, brain surgery, and found that surgeons who played first-person shooter games regularly made 37% less mistakes in their surgery. So next time, heaven forbid any of you need surgery, right? But next time you're getting wheeled into the surgery place just before the anaesthetist has a go at you, just say, do you, do you play Call of Duty? <laughs> and if the surgeon says, no, just be like, wheel me out. <laughs> I want someone who does. True, right? And so, um, and another one for educators, and I'm just going to finish on this one slide, on this slide, but um, this 94% on task focused. Other studies have shown that if a child is using a game in the classroom, they are 94%, oh, sorry, 94 of their class time for that period, that class period, is focused on the task. There is no other methodology, no other pedagogy. Nothing does that. Nothing. I think the next highest is 64, and that's for engaged, well-behaved, interested children. Is the, the best you're going to get is 64. 94 if you use games. So lots to think about there. But then people say to me, yeah, but it can, they can't really grow. Like, it's not like that big, like big, big. And I say to them, well, look at that. The International League of Legends finals in Shanghai in China. $34 million prize pool. We're now branching into esports at this point. 18 teams, 90 players, filled a stadium and had live streams uh, all over the world. And then people say, yeah, well, th that's easy, right? It's China. You want to fill, fill a stadium, go to China. I remember going to a book festival once in China and I was in, uh, I was in the stadium and we were ready for the doors to open and I could see people. And I said to the guy who was organizing it, I said, so how many are we expecting today? Thinking he was going to say 100,000. And he said, 2.1 million. And I was like, sorry, what? And it was 2.1 million, and they'd paid like $10 for a ticket. I was, so you want the audience, go to China. But you would say that, but then this is Paris. Same population as uh, uh, of France, same population as the UK, give or take. 24 teams, 120 players, $2.2 million prize pool, 106 million unique viewers. This is where people are choosing, and this is the critical thing. This is where people are choosing to spend their time. You've probably heard all those things about how the internet, Facebook, TikTok, they're all looking for your attention because if they've got your time, they can advertise to you. They can this is where children are choosing to spend, adults are choosing to spend that time. This is the space they're in. Now, I don't care about advertising. I don't want to sell to children. I want to educate them. So let's just put the same principles in there. Let's just imagine the power we could have if we took the same principles that the Facebooks and the TikToks and instead we put maths and science and history and literacy in there. We couldn't fail, but we won't do it. It's a fight, right? Which is why we're all here today. And by the way, speaking of being here today, I just want to tell you that 20 years ago, this was impossible to imagine. 
10 years ago, people would have laughed. I did get laughed out of the room when I said, we should run events on game-based learning. Five years ago, people were using it as an experiment. And then here we are. We're talking about it. I've just come back from Malta last week, similar thing. South Africa the week before that, similar thing. I was in Thailand uh, last month, similar thing. Um, all over the world, people are talking about it. That was impossible 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. And then finally, and this has just been released. Now, this one's incredible. This one really is incredible. Not just the game, which is also incredible. 10 million copies sold, grossing around $700 million in three days on one platform. It's only available on the Nintendo Switch, which I have with me. It's <laughs> no surprise. Um, <laughs> Kel Surprise, a six-hour flight, flies by. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's, you can't get it on PC, can't get it on Xbox, can't get it on PlayStation. They're, you have to own one of these to play it, and they still sold 10 million copies in three days, $700 million. That's insane. That's what the CEO of Netflix was talking about. And so my work has taken me, I, I, I'm going to give you a brief on my actual work, by the way, not my planes and unicorns. But um, I, I've, I've been very lucky to travel to over 70 countries and run projects and programs in over 70 countries. I've been an educator for 20 years um, and realized very quickly in my career that we should be doing more with games. In fact, it was literally day one. Um, I've, I have used 140 plus games. I think I'm on 147 now. I've used everything from this war of mine to Journey to Kerbal Space Program, Little Big Planet. In fact, yeah, Little Big Planet. I've used um, From Dust to talk about, to teach geography and, and, and the science, earth science. I've used Valiant Hearts to talk about World War I um, and so on. I've used all of the Age of Empires to look at history across the entire world. I, know, I learned more about Joan of Arc and Barbarossa and even my own William Wallace playing Age of Empires than school ever taught me or was ever prepared or geared to teach me. Um, that's where I learned it. Civilization. Uh, which is wonderful, um, sort of top-down rather than on the ground. Uh, I've already talked about the Assassin's Creed series, and people say, you can't use Assassin's Creed in the class. That's ridiculous. But actually, I worked with Ubisoft as part to, to create part of their um, discovery tours. So take away the blood, take away the killing. There's no need for that. We'll just have a discovery tour where you can get on a horse and you can go around Greece and you can meet merchants and you can meet shipping um, shipwrights and you can help them to learn about building boats and you can read their languages and why not? Why not take those immersive worlds and make them truly almost intrinsically educa uh, educational? Any of the city builders, this is Cities XL, which I happen to really enjoy, but that's been replaced now most commonly with um, city skylines. One of the interesting things about that is there was a, a, a European study carried out in 2017, I think, um, round about then, and it asked across Europe, it asked people who were in city building, city politics, architecture, and infrastructure engineers, why they chose their career. And over 90% of them quoted SimCity and said, I played SimCity when I was a kid and I really enjoyed it. So I thought I could do that. And they did. That's what they do as a job in some capacity. Sewage engineers and everything. They were like, oh yeah, SimCity. Um, that's remarkable though. So what we're really talking about there is that games can literally create career trajectories for our children. And yet here we are in schools all over the world going, oh, how do we help our children to get into the careers that are out there? How do we close the digital skills gap? I don't know how to get my children there. SimCity is a good start. Um, Kerbal Space Program, uh, which is just, if you haven't played it, play it. It's a space rocket simulator, hyper difficult learning curve. I literally have never managed to get a rocket into orbit um, in like three years but I have 11 year old kids that have managed to get rockets into space, go round the moon several times, take some photographs, and because there's people, technically Kerbals, on that, little people on that ship, they've sent up food. And they've done all the mathematics to make sure that the food capsule meets on the right side of the moon. It's just a remarkable stuff. I, I can't even get off the ground. Universe Sandbox, um, for playing with your, like literally throw Earth at Jupiter and see what happens. Or, 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 or I, I use that, and you can do this in VR, by the way, you can just lie on the floor and look at the universe above you, and then you can place the planets wherever you like. But you could take existing models like our solar system, and then you just change the mass of the moon by 0.0000001%. And the kids go, 
doesn't make a difference. And then you speed up time 25,000 years and we all die. And the kids are like, oh. Or you make the sun half a degree hotter and the kids go, nothing wrong with that. And you speed up time 40 years and we're all dead. And the kids are like, oh, climate change is real. And so, um, and so but, it, but it, right, it has an impact because we can play with science. We can play with space. It's not, it's not conceptual anymore. It's concrete. And that's one of the critical things about games is they make these experience concrete. Even if that experience is a unicorn running through an 80s fantasy poster, it's still concrete uh, than, more than it was. Portal 2, maths, angle, speed, velocity, distance. You can play with all of those maths and engineering concepts just by playing Portal. And so I do that. I, these are just some of the games. But I do this across three particular col um, uh, pillars of education. I make sure that everything I do, I take games, I audit them, I wrap curriculum and pedagogical practice and assessment back around them and then I re-deliver them back to the education system to meet three uh, core pillars, curriculum, social, uh, social and emotional learning and career readiness. And it all started with this game, Command and Conquer Red Alert, 1996. Um, I, I wasn't teaching in 1996, incidentally, I was teaching like five years later, but I was... Oh, I was in my, uh, my first year of teaching and I, um, and I got given this class and I got asked to look at European, you need to teach the European history of, and geography of World War II. The kids at the end should be accessible on key cities, key dates, key spaces and places um, and key battles. That's their assessment. And we're all teaching to the assessment, right? And so I, I looked at the, in fact, what I did was I put a blank map of Europe on the wall and I said to my kids, show me Germany. And they pointed at France. And I was like, oh, man, we got our work cut out. And so what I did was I brought in my own PlayStation 1 and I plugged it in. I don't even know how I did it, but I somehow dongled it into a whiteboard back then. And, and I split my kids just like this room, I said, right, top corner there, you're Britain, down here, you're France, uh, you guys in the middle are Germany, you've got Poland, we've got an, a, the critical sort of spaces. And then I gave them all balls of paper. The Russians had red, the Germans had grey, the Brits had green, the French had blue. And then as we talked through that very top level flow of World War II, the kids got to throw paper at each other. Um, and then as each country kind of came and went, the they got, they got to assimilated, if you like. Um, and so they, became, they were like, oh, so now I'm French, oh, I'm, I'm in Germany, oh, that's amazing. And they loved it. So then I just took the same theory and did it digitally. So each time we talked about these places and spaces, these key battles, the, the crossing of the Maginot Line, for example, we did it in Command and Conquer, except the kids didn't necessarily win when they were supposed to or lose when they were supposed to. So they made their own World War II. And they were able to say, yeah, we, didn't, we did this, we did that. It was top-down isometric kind of strategy. And they were able to kind of decide their own the fate. Having said that, I was also saying, but remember, that's not what happened in real life. Because what happened was the French withdrew from, except, oh, we got to Dunkirk and then we did this. And the kids were like, right, 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 right. We got to the exams at the end and we, got, we smashed the exams. Our, there, was, there wasn't a single kid that didn't get over 90%. So much so that my head teacher pulled me before a board and said, what are you up to? Because a young teacher, first year, having that success with those kids was like, some, I was giving them the answer sheets or something. I must have given them the answer sheets. So I showed them. I said, this is what I did. It's the only thing I did that was different. I never asked for permission, by the way. I'd never asked for permission. He was like, it was only then that he discovered I had a PlayStation in the classroom. Um, and he was like, oh. So I showed him. And actually, what was really remarkable was I wiped the map down that we had because we were using the map on the wall um, to, to, the kids were sort of writing when they'd won and what they'd done and what country was where, uh, where and what city they'd conquered or liberated. And then when we were finished, they said, um, I, I wiped the map down. Uh, this was like three weeks later, and I said to the kids, show me where, point at France, they did. Point at Paris, Germany, you know, point at Berlin, they did. Point at, point at, point at. Then I started to use obscure ones. Show me where Riga is. Tell me why Riga's really important strategically. Show me where Bratislava is. Where's Trieste? And they were like, oh, Italian border. Um, and, and, and my head teacher was just like, wow. I said, draw the Danube. So they went up with their pen, and it's roughly here, and they drew what looked like the Danube on the river. And the teacher was like, I've never seen anything like it. Why? Because they hadn't just read about it, and I value books in schools, and you know, by the way, that's important. They hadn't just seen an old black and white video of it. 
they'd been it. They'd been the soldiers. They'd been the generals. They'd, they'd taken that land. They believed in the, what it was they were trying to do. So he said to me, do that again. So I did it the following year and the following year again. And then in my fourth year, I switched because I was bored with that. And I was like, let's use Tomb Raider. So all of my kids became Lara Croft. And they went around the world and we learned about the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Mesopotamians and the Chinese and the Japanese and all those ancient cultures. Clothing, culture, currency, language, food and religion. We had a map on the wall and every time we got there, we did a little bit of string and then the kids could find out where Lara was and who she was, who she was exploring. And then um, I've used those 147 games all the way along until we finally get to Minecraft, which came along 14 years ago and it was the big game changer for me because suddenly I was no longer held to someone else's narrative. I was no longer just using someone else's um, a story or someone else's graphic assets. or so If I wanted to do the fall of Constantinople, I did it. If I wanted to look at Scottish castles, we did it. If I wanted to look at the refugee crisis across Europe in 2015, we did it. And we made children refugees. Um, and so games have really fundamentally changed the way, and particularly, that's a heavy door. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> she's really struggling with that. Um, and so... Games have fundamentally changed the way that I have taught and my students have learned to great success. And I'm very happy to say that I have an army of hugely successful exam students, and I'm never happy about that, but exam students out there, you know, I leave a trail of, of kids that succeeded because we played Minecraft and we taught them about Pompeii, um, which, by the way, in my workshop at 10 o'clock, this is the, one of the worlds I'll be showing you. Um, and I just want to, for the time I've got left, I've got about 10 minutes left, I just want to focus on why this goes beyond the digital, though. I think it's very, very, very important that I don't stand here and say, so you should all be sticking your kids in video games for eight hours a day, because that's not true. It's absolutely critical that we do this fidgetally. I hate all that stuff. Oh, edutainment. I hate all that. Um, but fidgetal works, right? It's that physical, physical meets digital. And if we can make it, and again, in my workshop in 10 minutes, uh, uh, 10 o'clock, I'll show you other fidgetal examples. But in this one, I use Lego. Let's get kids into piles of Lego. And in this particular example, I threw those children into big piles of Lego and I let them play. You need that glorious 30 to 40 minutes of just playtime. Let them talk, let them laugh. It's always amazing to me how many kids sing. Like they're shy when they first meet you and they don't want to go into the Lego pile. And then 20 minutes later, they're singing and they're la 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 and then another kid joins in and then I join in and it's a thing, right? And I'm like, Human beings singing together only happens when they're in flow and they're in play and they're happy and, and safe and, and in a trusted environment. Play creates that. So I throw them into this Lego pit and then I say to them, after the 30, 40 minutes, I say, now, we're going to head over to some devices and I'm going to teach you about something. Now, one of the things I also fundamentally believe is that we consistently underestimate children. We set curriculum that is way lower than, than they're capable of. We don't start in the UK, for example, we don't start teaching children plan elevation, side elevation and isometrics until 12 to 14 years old. I've got kids seven and eight years old doing that in sketch form so they can get into oh, workshops and things. Absolutely. Um, so they can get into that uh, that that headspace in Minecraft. And so I take them aside in this particular example. I said, we're going to learn about hydroelectric power. And one of the parents at the event said, oh, hang on, my little girl's not ready for that. That's not, that's not a thing. And I said, well, just, just, just give me an hour. So we took them to some devices and we learned about hydroelectric power. I explained how dams work and why we need high topography and low topography. And to do that, we usually flood a, a, a valley. And then, and then when that valley's filled up, we have to create a dam. Actually, you create the dam first. We create the dam, then flood the valley. Um, and then that creates this. And they were like, did they flood whole places? And I said, well, where I live, they flooded a whole place and it used to have a town in it. And when the water gets so low, you can still see the church spire and all the kids were like, bonkers bonkers and then the water then weighs a set amount which means if we squeeze it through a tiny a small enough hole we can turn a turbine because that creates water pressure da, da, da. where does the stuff come? it comes from rain where does the water come from it comes from the rain and so oh learned all about it then we send them immediately back to the pile of lego and that little girl there and that's her mum helping out who doubted they build that and you hear them use all the language i listen to them i'm like i say to the parents listen and the little girl, she couldn't say topography. She said topography. 
So, but she said, we need topography, so I need lots of rocks. And she built the rocks. And we need a dam, so we need lots of, you get the white stuff, I'll get the blue stuff. We need high water, we need low water. We need, we need, we need. Because she's, she's, now I'm not saying that little girl to this day will remember everything she needs to know about hydroelectric power. She was tiny. She probably went away and forgot by next week. And that's okay. But what I was proving to the parents was, this is how we teach. This is how we engage children in really difficult or complex subjects. We do it through play. And then the next day, because it was a weekend event, Sunday morning, who was first in the queue? But that little girl and her mum. Right at the door, when I opened the door, she was like, what's she doing today? I said, well, today she's going to build it in Minecraft. And, and we gave them, there was no Lego that day. They just died straight on and they built it in Minecraft and it works. And this little addition here, this thing here, that little fish ladder, that was because one of the little boys said, I was speaking to my dad last night and I said to him, where do the fish go? Like if we block the rivers. And my dad didn't know. I didn't ask him that. That was homework. And he took it upon himself because he was thinking it through. Then he asked his dad, who didn't know. So then his dad said, well, ask the man in the morning. And so we did a whole sex, extra session on... Um, River ecology and protecting the fish and creating structures for the fish. And by the way, that works. When it rains, the reservoir fills up. And then when the reservoir fills up, it creates overflow. And then the overflow triggers redstone, which then gives a house electricity so the kids can see the process in Minecraft. In the UK, there's a wonderful old home called Pennycook House. I'm going to skip through this relatively quick because I've got four minutes, five minutes left. Um, Pennycook House, built in the 1600s, burned down in the 1800s, belonged to a very rich uh, uh, noble family. And... Um, this is it burning down in 1899. It actually burned down to the point where they couldn't do anything about it, so they basically had tea on the lawn. Typically Victorian, right? They were like, oh, damn. Uh, and then just watched it. They rescued the pictures and the piano and everything and just watched it burn. And the ruin now still lies there today. The sad thing is none of the kids in the local schools have any idea what the building is because we're so busy teaching them about crossing the Maginot Line that we're not actually teaching them about their local history and culture, which as a Scot, I think is really important. Um, certainly for my people. I'm sure the Belgians do in particular for them as well. And so what we did was we took them to the building. I'm going to go back to that slide. We took them to the building and we gave them pens and pencils and paints and we got a drone and we had a rope technician specialist and we got them to collect data and they painted it and they sketched it and they, and they filmed it and they, all this wonderful stuff. And then when we were done, they took all that data back to school and we built it in Minecraft. We even did an archaeological dig to see if we could find something that wasn't there. But... Um, but we built it one to one scale. One cube is, sorry, one block is, is one meter cubed. And so they built every window, every fireplace, every pillar, everything. And then I had them fix it. I had them add the chimneys. And then on the Friday, we came back to the classroom dressed as Victorians. We had tea. We rescued the furniture and we set fire to it in Minecraft, just like on the night of 1899. And I had gone in and changed the bits that, they, that I knew needed to burn away and crumble, I changed them to flammable materials. So as the kids watched the building burn, it disappeared. The chimneys disappeared, the roof disappeared, the windows disappeared, all of the floors disappeared and the beds and all the stuff that they weren't able to rescue until all that was left was the ruin. And then we exported it and sent it to a 3D printer and then we 3D printed it and every kid got a model which we then painted and sprinkled grass on and then we went back to the building and we had a photography competition to see who could capture the best angle of the building that they'd made against the original building. Skip forward to the parents' evening three months later, and the parents, I said to the parents, is there anything that we, we did this year that stood out? Is there anything that you would like to comment on? I can't tell you how many parents said to me, if I hear about Pennycook House one more time. It was built in the 1600s. It was burned down in 1893. It was right before the century. It was owned by the Clark family and he, they made their money selling fabrics to India. They were like, I can't listen to it again. That's examination, right? When it comes to, that's what I want them to remember. If we must teach to the exam, that's how we do it. And then finally, and I'm going to finish on this one in two minutes, in South Africa, we have a man who lives in this building here in a township called Kagiso where there is no school. There are very difficult places to live. Girls get pregnant at 11 and 12 years old, as is their duty. Uh, I'd say that that's not their duty, but that's what they believe down there. And because there's no education otherwise, and the boys go into either extremely low paid work or they get into drugs and gangs. And it's a tragic place. And I met a guy who lives in this little hut here. And I thought, what would happen? Hi, I said, my, my theory was, what if we could buy, sorry, what if we could build a, a school? 
And so you go through all the motions of, you know, at the time I was working in uh, collaboration with Microsoft and they were like, well, that's a lot of money and mm, a lot of commitment. I said, no, 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 what if we could do it with a single 3D printer? What if we could make a school with a 3D printer? Well, Western democratic minds go, that's ridiculous. You'd have to play, you'd have to make millions of plastic bricks. But what we did was we took a single 3D printer and one copy of Minecraft and we taught this little boy called Joseph Mary, thank you, how to make toys, him and all his friends. And imagine saying to that kid, this box can make you anything, anything you want. Anything at all. I said, anything. So we'll make toys. So that's what we did. We designed toys. We created them in Minecraft. I taught them all about making scale. So this was one laptop, my own, and one 3D printer, my own, down in this, this village, uh, well, vast township. We then made the toys, 3D printed them, painted them. Now this is Joseph Mary's spinning top. Great success. And then with the money that we sold the bricks, uh, the, the, the toys for, we bought bricks. And with bricks, we built a classroom and then another one and another one. And the project's still going today. There's a school in Kagiso that has 31 children in it. Somebody donated books, somebody donated paper, somebody gave us roof tiles. There's a school down there now. That might only be 31 children, but it's 31 that had no other space or place to go in that. And, and all it took was one 3D printer and one copy of Minecraft as a game. So my point is this. All of you today have permission to play. If you have not been arrested by 3 p.m., okay, for climbing a tree, I will not have done my job here today, all right? The Belgian police need to be busy by the afternoon, all right? Um, but, oh, permission, end to play. Sorry, I got that wrong. Anyway, <laughs> ignore the end. You have permission to play. I think we all need to be better at that. And if we can play, then we become more playful in our education and our systems and jobs. One last thing I would like to mention is that here, if you are interested in learning more about this stuff in your language, um, there is a uh, wonderful, he's left now to do another workshop, but Luke Van den Bosch and the Minecraft, uh, sorry, the Microsoft team here have put together a, 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 a community. They, oh, hi, yes, hi, called Mint, which is wonderful. And you can learn much, much more, not from people like me who then come and visit, but people in your environment, in your space, um, helping you out step by step to embrace this stuff um, one step at a time. Thank you so much. <laughs>